Hello and welcome to the lecture on Chapter 4 of Networking Fundamentals, the Transport Layer of the OSI Model. In this particular chapter, we're going to discuss the OSI Model Layer 4, which is the model responsible for guaranteed reliable delivery between a sending host and a receiving host and vice versa. However, in this chapter, we're going to discuss the actual protocols for the TCP IP protocol stack that work at Layer 4. Those two protocols are TCP, the Transmission Control Protocol, which does provide guaranteed reliable delivery, and UDP, the user datagram protocol, which does not provide guaranteed reliable delivery. UDP is a connectionless protocol that works at layer four of the TCP IP model. The reason for this is pretty simple. The OSI model, again, is a model of how a protocol stack should work between a uh, two hosts. The TCP IP model is a true working real world model of how the interactions occur between two hosts using TCP IP. Keep that in mind as we go through this discussion. In the transport layer, one of the things we need to do is to make sure that information can be sent from a sending host to a receiving host in an orderly fashion, also that it can be segmented. One of the main concepts we talk about here is segmentation. In other words, that we may have a very large web page that we're trying to get from a site well, if we send it as one big large piece, imagine what would happen if there was an error right in the middle of that sending or receiving. We would have to retransmit that entire inf piece of information, a large sum of information. Also, one of the things we need to be able to do is, in, just anytime you have your PC open, think about the number of different connections you have available to you. You may be connected, as this particular PC is in this example, to instant messaging, which is up and running at all times. You may be emailing, have your email up and running. You may have multiple web pages open. You know, you may be looking at your stock portfolio while at the same time reading your emails on a web page. In addition, you may have uh, voice over IP running using something like Cisco Communicator or Skype or any of those different items that we have. So how does your PC keep up with those multiple connections to multiple different servers out on the internet? That is handled by the transport layer. And we'll talk about how it's handled by the TCP uh, protocol as we move along. Segmentation, back again, talking about the, uh, the process of segmenting information. We take these large requests and we break them into smaller segments and we send them out in smaller pieces. This helps us for a couple reasons. One, no single communication hogs the entire bandwidth on your, uh, on your media. And two, if a piece is lost in transmit, you only have to retransmit a small little segment of data instead of a huge amount of data, which is very useful. It does add some problems for us, though. We have to be able to label our segments so that we know what particular stream or process they're associated with. Is this part of a web page connection, or is this part of an instant message connection that's been broken into pieces? We also need to label these segments so they can be reassembled on the receiving end into the correct order. That is very important and is uh, accomplished with multiple items in TCP. So again, data segmentation facilitates data carriers by lower network layers. It all also allows for multiplexing because we can break it into these smaller pieces and then give each individual application or entity X amount of time on the media or medium, multiplex it. And then of course it helps with error checking because we can just check errors on the small segments and retransmit only those segments that have problems, not the entire communication. So what does the transport layer do? Well, it establishes a session. Okay, now that is if it is a connection-oriented layer four protocol. Okay, connection-oriented layer four protocols establish a session to ensure that the sending and receiving host can connect to each other. All right. It uh, allows for reliable delivery by doing error checking. Okay, we'll talk about that with uh, windowing, and we'll look at error checking and sequencing. We'll talk about sequence numbers. Same order delivery allows to make sure the segments are, are when they're received on the receiving end, that they're put back in the correct order, again with sequence numbers. And then flow control can actually handle congestion. That is handled in TCP with what we're going to call, or what is called a sliding window. And that is the amount of data that can be sent before you have to get an acknowledgement. We'll talk about that in, in coming slides. So, here's the thing. The TCP IP model transport layer performs the exact same function as the transport layer of the OSI model. But, there are different requirements based upon different applications above 
layer 4. For instance, if you're using any protocol that requires fast, low overhead, no need for retransmission such as IP telephony or streaming video, you need a layer 4 transport protocol that can handle that, that is actually connectionless. That's why the TCP IP model, when they created it, they created the user datagram protocol so that you can send any application traffic that does not need error checking, sequencing, those types of things. Still has sequencing, but doesn't do error checking and acknowledgments. Now, protocols that need reliable guaranteed delivery, the application layer protocols that need that, such as HTTP, SMTP, those protocols use TCP at layer 4 of the TCP IP model because the transmission control protocol is a connection oriented guaranteed reliable delivery protocol. So let's discuss those two in detail. Here is an example of the two headers found with TCP and UDP. Just from this slide alone you should see which one has more overhead. The header for TCP is much larger. You notice it has a source port. Okay, That is uh, picked at random by the sending host and the source port is some number above 1024. The destination port is the application that port that the request is going to on the server. So for instance, if it's going to a web server and this is a TCP segment, the destination port is 80 because that's a well-known port for TCP. Sequence numbers, those are the numbers used to make sure that packets um, or segments are actually rearranged in the correct order once they're received on the receiving end. Acknowledgement numbers, those are used to acknowledge sequence, number, sequence numbers to ensure that you did receive, let's say, uh, segments 1 through 44. So I'm going to acknowledge 44 with a 45 and tell you to start with 45 and submit the next set. Checksum, which is layer 4 error checking. Uh, and then on down the application layer data, which is the actual information that was passed down from the application layer of the TCP, by, TCP IP model which would be the application presentation and session information that are contained in the OSI model. Now let you use a datagram. There's source destination port, lint, checksum, boom, we're done. That's it. All right. Uh, not even any sequence numbers. It has to be the application layers above has to have to be able to deal with sequencing. So the application has to know how to put the pieces back together. Not layer four when you're using UDP. This is a very important thing to look at and to understand. The bigger the header, Typically, okay, there are some exceptions because of uh, hardware based uh, features that are being used with IPv6, which is layer 3. But typically, the bigger the header, the more overhead. So, TCP has more overhead. Now, we talk about these port addresses. So, we talk about um, a source port and destination port. Well, in order to keep up with all the communications a host has on it, in other words, like I said earlier, you have your, your PC open. You're connected to two web pages, you're connected to your instant messaging, and you're connecting to your email. How does your PC keep up with all those connections? It does it by ports. So each one of those uh, connections from your PC, there's a source port that your PC picks at random from above 1024. There's a destination port that is based upon what are called well-known port numbers. So in other words, TCP port 110 is the port for POP, POP3. Okay. TCP port 80, that's the destination port for web traffic or HTTP. Now, uh, TCP 531, that is actually instant messaging port for AOL Instant Messenger. And there are others, TCP 21 and 20, FTP data and uh, FTP control. Uh, TCP 23, which is Telnet. But these are all ports used to tell the information when the segment when it comes into the host. Okay, where do I pass this up to? What application above layer four should receive this information? So if a server is running, in fact, this could all be the same server. This could be this one host connecting to a server running POP3, HTTP, and an AOL Instant Message uh, server. In that case, that server has three different applications all listening on port 110, port 80, and port 531. That way you can see that this one client could connect to one server on three separate services at the application layer. 
and the client and the server can keep up with those connections using these port numbers. Right. Likewise, the client right here could be connected to three totally separate servers and using the port numbers, source ports that it has to keep up those communications with those destination servers. So here's some well-known port numbers. Uh, 0, to 1, 0 to 1023 are, are reserved for well-known port numbers. 1024 to 49151, those are registered ports. And then there are some dynamic ports. Now, our well-known TCP ports that we usually use, uh, TCP 21 is FTP, 23 is Telnet, 25 is SMTP, uh, 80 is HTTP, 110 is POP3, 194 is IRC, 443 is HTTPS, 143 is IMAP, that's not one that's actually on here. Okay. There's some registered ports that are above 1024, okay. 1863, 2000, that's Cisco's SCCP uh, skinny control protocol. 8008, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, and also try to memorize uh, TFTP, RIP, and probably RADIUS 1812 because that shows up a, a great deal. And then here are some common ports. There, there are some services that run on both TCP and UDP. Uh, DNS system is, is a, a very good example. When two DNS servers talk to one another and share information, they do it with TCP. But when a client talks to a DNS server to do a DNS request, it's UDP. Both, though, however, TCP or UDP communications for DNS use port 53. Um, so those are some that, that, that you need to be aware of. Commit those to memory because that will, that will help you a lot. Now, if you want to see what your PC is actually listening to, you can run the command netstat uh, at the command prompt, and it will show you all the listening uh, or established connections for your machine. This would show here that this particular PC has a working connection to uh, a web server, okay, at 152, 169, 152 and 169, 207.138, okay. This is the name of the PC, okay, which has been resolved, which is, could be an IP address if it, if it didn't have the name resolved. This is the source port, some random number above 1024, and the destination is this IP address, the socket, and a socket is an IP address and a port number, but this IP address and this port number of HTTP, which is actually port 80, they just show it to as HTTP in the next output. Okay, so source port, okay, address of the remote host, destination port, okay, and the connection state. We'll talk about established in a minute. This means, uh, established means you have completed a TCP three-way handshake. You've sent your send, send, act, and act, and you have a fully established connection. This is a very good command to teach your security students also, or for security students to know. Netstat will allow you to see any incoming connections to your machine or outgoing connections from your machine. If you have a virus or a trojan that is not listed in the processes, many times or sometimes you can go into Netstat if the virus writer has not done a good job and look at the listening connections and you'll see a program listening a bit. Now what is that? And that is actually a program that is uh, malware on your machine. So here we go. Segmentation, reassembly. Here's what we need to do. We take this application layer data, this big request for a web page. We break it into segments and then create UDP datagrams or TCP segments. All right. And each one of those has a header associated with it and the pieces are broken down into data. Now here's the thing. The UDP header only has source destination ports and very small amount of information based on that header we saw earlier. TCP has source of destination por uh, ports, sequencing to make sure they're delivered in order, acknowledgement, flow control with windowing, all those things are built into TCP. But UDP and TCP do the same thing. They still take large pieces of application layer data, break it or segment it into smaller pieces, send it across the link to the uh, receiving side, and then the receiving side uses that information to reassemble it and pass it up to the correct application layer protocol or application. All right, 
right, so here's our TCP segment headers, source port, destination port, okay? Our sequence number, we'll talk about those as we move on. Acknowledgement number, the next octet expected by the receiver. So this is the one that's the last octet, and then the acknowledgement's the next one expected. Header length, reserve, set, just set to zero. Flags, if there are any, we'll talk about those flags. There are six flags uh, that are used. Um, we'll talk about the reset, urge, push, uh, finac. Window size, this is how many how many octets can be received before you get an acknowledgement? Uh, one thing about window size in TCP and in Windows operating systems, the window size is what's called a sliding window. In other words, the window size will start at a certain size and as there are uh, large amounts of data being sent and it's successful and you don't have to retransmit, uh, the window size will get a little bit bigger and it will slide out until you start having problems sending that amount of data without having errors in transmission then the window will slide back down to sort of just based upon the conditions on the network, so a sliding window. The checksum is layer 4 error checking. Remember, there's also a layer 2 error checking, data link layer, but layer 4 doesn't know what layer 2 is doing. So you have layer 4 error checking and layer 2 error checking. And you have the urge pointer, if you have the urge flag, and then any options, and the data is all that application data that's been placed into this particular segment. So, we want to set a, uh, we want to make a communication. So this client one wants to talk to this web server. It creates a, it takes application data, puts that, you know, takes all of it, breaks into small pieces, makes that the data at layer four, places a header on it that has a source port, that's a random number above 1024, and destination port of 80, and the protocol being TCP since this is HTTP. This request will go up okay, to the server, and that server will establish a connection. Now, we're kind of glossing over some stuff here because the first thing that would happen would be a 308 handshake. We're going to assume that's already taken place. Likewise, client 2 is trying to connect to the SMTP or the mail server on this server, and so it's going to send a request with a random source port above 1024, destination port of 25. So. Response ports, notice that when the response comes back, the source port is the original destination port and the destination port is the client's port. This way, both entities, the client and the server, can keep up with this communication, right? Because if client one, after this, you know, after it established this web connection to this server, also wanted to establish an email connection to the server, it would simply formulate an SMTP request pick a different random source port and the destination port would be 25 so this server could keep up with multiple connections between different clients that it has to service. So now one of the things we have to do with TCP, TCP is connection oriented. That means you must ensure that the receiving side is available and can be reached before you try to send information. TCP does this with what is called a three-way handshake. So when A wants to talk to B, let's say it wants to request a web page or, or request an email, the first thing it does is sends a send. A TCP send goes over with the sequence number of A. Now sequence numbers are randomized by operating systems. Um, guessing sequence numbers is a, a trick hackers try to do because then they can intercept communications. Um, but for right now we're just going to talk, it's a random number that's pulled out uh, by A as a sequence number. So it sends a send over to B. B will send back a SENAC and what it does is it takes, B sends its sequence number, okay, and then sends back an act that is one more than the initial sequence number sent by A. This way A knows that B saw its sequence number. Okay? And then finally, A will send back an act which sends the sequence number 101, which says I received the fact that you know what my sequence number is, and I'm sending back an act of 301 so that I know, you know, I know it gets a little confusing, but you know now that I have seen your initial sequence number of 300. At this point, what you have is you have a, um, 
the three-way handshake, and you have what is called an established session. All right, these established sessions are what show up in NetStat, and once this occurs, once a send, send act, and act occurs, then you can actually start sending application data as segments. If this process fails at any point, you know, I send my send, I don't receive a send act, or if I send a send, B sends back the send act, but A never sends an act, that's called a half open connection. If that fails at any point, you cannot start sending data as part of segments. Another neat thing about TCP, since it is connection oriented, when a communication process ends, A can actually stop the process by sending a fin, okay, a, basically a finished bit. I'm done, send an act, okay, gotcha. Fin received, send an act, act received. And that will actually drop the connection, okay. So if you're connected to a web page, and you're surfing on it, surfing on it, surfing on it, you've completed a three-way handshake, but you're done, you close your web browser, and that connection is finished, it drops that whole connection, okay? So you don't have open connections with TCP. UDP can't do this. UDP doesn't have the ability to, to create a session or a connection because UDP is connectionless. UDP has to rely on timers to drop sessions. Here's a, uh, a, a Wireshark capture of the three-way handshake. Now, here's one thing that's going to be a little confusing. In Wireshark, there's an option called relative sequence number. By default, Wireshark hides from you the actual sequence numbers because they're usually very big numbers. Um, so this is step one. This particular host, 10111, is sending a request to 192.168.254.254. Okay, the source port is a random number above 1024. The destination port is port 80. But we're sending our SIN, okay? And here's our relative sequence number of zero. You can actually go into the options under Wireshark and turn off relative sequence numbers. And I actually do this when I demonstrate it in class so the students can see the big sequence numbers, okay? But they're using relative sequence numbers. So here's the SIN. Here's the ACK that comes back from 192.168.254.254. 210111. You'll notice that the acknowledgement is 1 and the sequence number that the host 192.168.254.254 is sending is the relative sequence number of 0. And then finally 10111 sends back an ACK and also sends back the relative sequ or the sequence number of 1 which says I saw your ACK to my sequence number and I'm ACKing your sequence number. Boom. Now we've got an established connection and you can actually see that session using that stat. Now here's the, uh, they go through a fin, you can walk through and look at this, how it sends a fin. You know, communication's over, I've done everything I want to do. Here's a fin bit set, okay, and here's all of our different uh, uh, flags. Urge, acknowledgement, push, reset, send, fin, okay, those are all there. And then here's the terminate session act. So, you're going to do this in the lab, so you get to actually play with the packet tracer and do it. You also get to do it in the real lab uh, for the class. All right. Now, TCP segments, because they have sequence numbers, that's how they're reordered. All the data okay, is segmented. It may take multiple different paths over to the destination. Once it's at the destination, the destination can take those sequence numbers and put it back together and ensure that it's in the correct order. Once it does that, puts it all together, then passes it up to the application layer. Now, UDP doesn't have sequence numbers. So what UDP has to do is it takes everything in it gets, passes it up to the application layer, and says, you handle it. I'm not handling it. I got it here. You handle putting it back together. So it has to be built in, baked into the applications that are using UDP. TCP has it baked into the protocol itself. Okay. So here's an acknowledgement. I'm sent, starting with byte number one. I'm sending 10 bytes. So I send 10 bytes. And it says, I received 10 bytes. Acknowledge is 11. So it says, I received the 10 because it, it sent back an act of 11, which is one more than 10. And it says, I expect byte number 11 next. Okay. And it will start. The next thing it will do, start with, that should actually be 11. It'll act and start, it'll act and then sequence 11 through whatever, 20. And it will continue on so that it, acknowledgement, it acknowledges X number of bytes that are sent and received. That 
the size or the number, this, this 10 bytes, that is determined by the window size. Okay? So a window is how many different uh, octets we can send before we have to get an acknowledgement. And this is just an example. I receive the first three, send an acknowledgement, getting the first three. Okay? Now I send the next three. Okay, boom. And so this is the process. Now, it missed the second group. He received no acknowledgement, or his machine received no acknowledgement, so it resent the last three. So that's how this works. You know, if you don't get an acknowledgement that it was received on the sending end, the sender can just resend, and TCP will do that. That's why it's guaranteed reliable delivery. Okay. So sequence number one to 1500, it says it received it. Sequence number 1501 to 3000, it sends an acknowledgement of 3001, it says, okay, good, then I'll send 3001 to 4500 and 4500 to 6000. So that window size is how many bytes are sent before you expect an acknowledgement from the receiving host. And the acknowledgement is the number of the next expected byte. So if I acknowledge 3001, the next sequence number should be 3001. Beauty of this, it all happens in the background. You're not even aware of it. The only time you're going to be aware of it is when there's retransmissions and there are problems and you have timeouts. Uh, those issues will, will show up. Here's an example. Okay, receiving acknowledgement 3001, but it lost some segments. Okay, and says it receives. Okay, 4501 it says, wait a minute, I lost some. I didn't get all these. So it acknowledges 3001 and it will resend. Okay, and it will actually resend that size. And then your window could actually shrink if you're having trouble with transmissions. UDP doesn't do any of this. UDP basically takes it, puts it in the little datagrams and throws it out. Okay? Uh, lost data datagrams are not reordered, uh, excuse me, are not resent. Lost uh, datagrams are not ordered correctly. All that has to be handled by the application layer protocol that UDP is supporting. So UDP is at, at layer four, their applications up here it's their job to ensure that the datagrams are put back together correctly and it's their job to make sure that anything that needs to be retransmitted is retransmitted. A lot of the protocols that use application layer protocols that use UDP don't retransmit at all because it would make no sense. It would be like a voice call if you suddenly retransmitted a word or a, uh, a sound. It would make no sense uh, to do that in a voice call. It's better just to drop it and let it be clipped. Okay. Same thing with UDP as far as listening for requests. Okay, a UDP server or server running DNS sits and listens on a socket, which is an IP address and a port number. So here they're showing they're showing a client requesting uh, DNS and another client requesting radius. Okay, same exact thing as before. Okay, here's a DNS request. Here's a radius request. Random source port, destination port is UDP 53. Okay, and all the way through just like before. Okay. No different. The, the major difference is how UDP handles the communication. No sequencing, no windows, no retransmission. UDP, here's how you remember it. UDP is the unreliable little brother to TCP. And that is it for chapter four, the, the transport layer of both the OSI model and the TCP IP model. Again, major points here. Remember, transport layer is responsible for guaranteed reliable delivery between two hosts. However, in our real world model, we have two different protocols that work at layer four of the transport layer. They are transmission control protocol, which is guaranteed reliable delivery, uses acknowledgement, uh, use three way handshake, uses acknowledgements, uses sequencing, and uses windows and retransmissions in order to guarantee delivery. We then have the unreliable little brother, which is UDP, which does not use any of those error checking or reliable mechanisms, and is concerned mainly with delivering datagrams as fast as possible between a sending and receiving host. Hope this has been helpful. Good luck.